work. Um, thanks to all the speakers for very interesting um, presentations and examples. Um, I was just particularly, I suppose, to Joe, I was interested in the context of the state having emerged now as an actor in terms of policy and legislation in the discussions this afternoon very much. Um, Brexit, if I can mention the word. Um, particularly, I suppose, it's highly sensitive in a Scottish context, but uh, with a lot yet to be decided in terms of what Scotland may or may not do. But obviously, given the land border situation, it raises very interesting similar analogies to the situation we face here in Ireland if the UK legislative regime changes substantially. And I was wondering, did you have any thoughts or strategies about the implications of that? Because clearly, the EU... Uh, has been critical in relation to its leadership in environmental legislation. I think, I mean, br briefly, uh, with, with Brexit, I probably could have, could have entitled my presentation uh, Reasons to be Depressed, but actually we're trying really hard in Scotland also to see the opportunity presented, most obviously by the, um, the, the reform of the common agricultural policy. So I think we, uh, I met actually last week with um, Mike Russell, who's Scotland's Brexit minister, um, a colleague and I sat down and had this discussion um, around Scotland's role within the UK actually being a champion for the natural environment if the natural environment falls down the priority list because obviously we are interdependent in many ways. I think sc the Scottish Government does see uh, the opportunity to be more progressive in this, this space. We've got a lot to learn from things that are going on in, in England, obviously, particularly through the work that DITA's committee um, has been doing. But in terms of actual implementation, um, I think uh, we, we've got to grasp this opportunity to completely reform our approach to um, agricultural subsidies or get rid of subsidies altogether and, and turn them into payments for ecosystem services. Um, so I th we've got a bit of a blank sheet. I think in Scotland, we've got the double uncertainty of not quite knowing what will happen next um, with regard to perhaps another referendum around Scottish independence. So we've got to start with what's our ideal scenario um, because everything else is up for grabs and uncertain, I think. I don't know if that really answers the question. There's, there's, there's Absolutely. I mean, it's the it's, it's huge. That's why I was saying, you know, you could end up being so incredibly depressed. You know, over 30 years, we've got the, the world's largest body of environmental legislation that has been built up so that we stand to lose an awful lot. So um, one of the comments made by Mike Russell was he um, provided an analogy with human rights legislation. He was saying, essentially, the three things that we're aiming for is it can't be less than what we've got at the moment. We've got to keep up with progress that is happening towards internationally agreed targets and not let those fall behind in the process of all the long-winded negotiations and so on. Um, and then, you know, thirdly, there's got to be an opportunity to do some things even, even better. So that doesn't just imply to the environment, but obviously uh, all of us in this room recognise that the a healthy natural environment underpins absolutely everything else. So there's a, there's a lot to lose, and we've obviously collectively got to be a, a very strong voice for that, um, I, th I think. And yeah, as you say, massive, massive implications. Um, okay, thank you very much, Joe. Anybody else like to come in? Yes, please. Million. Uh, I'm Jean Moore from the National Economic and Social Council. I just wanted to ask about the Flemish example, Martin, about the the year-long process you took to develop the framework, and I'm just very interested in w what kind of public engagement process did you have in that, if there was one, and how, how do you see the role of the public in, in relation to the development of, of what seems very um, resource-intensive and very ambitious to, uh, and, and very impressive uh, to get to, to this far. So I'm just very interested to learn from that for, from, our, from an Irish perspective. Yeah. Um, first of all, to make sure, uh, we are a small team and we are quite independent in our work. So we had the, the freedom to think and to discuss things in our own team and do also the discussion with the, yeah, the outer world. Um, but there was not a real uh, public discussion in the sense that we didn't consult um, individual citizens or so. But we did quite a lot of uh, discussions with uh, the social, so social society, like uh, farmer groupings, uh, groups, uh, nature and conservancy um, groups, um, also some policy, or some companies. Um, but the main interaction was in the review process and the discussing on uh, what was on paper. Not in, in, in the development of the framework, it was already harsh enough with a small team. 
Um, but the main discussions were afterwards when we were writing things down and made statements in our report and uh, to fine tune those statements and those recommendations that was in close contact with um, organizations from civil society and Flemish administrations. But it was a quite um, difficult process. Some of our reports were set back to zero and they said start again. And, and because we had the time, we could do that, but it, it, was, it was a harsh, pro, uh, a harsh uh, project. And, and, but it's, it's very important to, to get all those different um, groups in society, to get them involved in, in the process. If, it, that's, if, if you can't do that, then um, you shouldn't start with it. The concept should be used on the ground, and if you can't convince people to use it, and if you're not um, willing to cope with their remarks, then it's, it's, it won't work. Okay, that's a very interesting, very useful view. Thank you. So there's another gentleman over there. Oh, it's Bruce Howard from the Ecosystems Knowledge Network. It's great to hear these examples from the three jurisdictions uh, and how we have this evidence base on natural capital uh, which uh, has arisen. I wonder if I could just ask our, the three on our panel to think of one action that they would like government of their jurisdiction to take in the light of the evidence base that is, you now have. And please be as, as specific as possible and perhaps think beyond the sort of environmental domain uh, of policy. Thank you. My first tip would be the bridging organizations. Gathering the knowledge is not that difficult. Uh, or, uh, universities can do it quite in an easy way, but translate those knowledge things to uh, on the field uh, difference or, or on the field actions, then you need bridging organizations. Those bridging organizations just help people on the ground with uh, translating the knowledge to practical uh, management things. And um, policy should invest in people that help those individual citizens, individual farmers, to, uh, yeah, to, to start with, with a pilot projects and so. Um, and people are, really need that help in order to get uh, the, the knowledge working on the ground. So bridging organizations is, for me, very important. I think the same applies for the Netherlands. Uh, we had a help desk for uh, businesses last uh, few years with uh, uh, companies uh, were able to uh, get free advice uh, for a few days to help them get along. And uh, there's so much information, so, much, so many tools, so many things uh, that uh, companies, private farmers, uh, governments, uh, local authorities can use, but it's very difficult to them to, uh, to get the right tools, to get the right advice. And so I think our government should invest in getting a body of people uh, who can sustain, uh, support uh, people who want to get started. And I think that's, and, and, and create a network that's really effective. I mean, I, th I think the, the single most important thing is probably what I've mentioned already in terms of the, the reform of the common agricultural policy or what, whatever succeeds that. Um, I think, though, that we, well, one of the things that um, business people often tell us, uh, and when I say tell us, it's the tell us the Scottish Forum, which also includes the Scottish Government. So Gary, the chief economist of the Scottish Government, is on the steering group, as am I from the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And so it's not, there's perhaps not quite that distance there. The, the Scottish Government is involved in, in formulating this. But um, we do hear a lot that, that business wants a clear steer from government because that provides certainty, provides a clear direction of travel, and, and so on. So that's one of the things that we, we discuss a lot within the steering group, um, just trying to work out what that actually looks like. Um, clearly, government, government can't uh, do everything. We need to look to business, but businesses, again, look to government for that, that strong steer. Just a question, do we need some um, national or, or international standards for uh, national capital? Um, it was a question this morning from the lady, uh, do we need to set uh, clear national, uh, nas natural capital um, baselines? in order to set, say to companies you can't go, or you can eat, you can't eat into the, the stock 
-hmm. and this is the level in which uh, at which you can use uh, the environment but not below that level do we need that on an international level or i think we probably do need to get better at defining where those critical thresholds are um for the, all of this to make sense uh I guess we also need to concentrate on some of the new initiatives that are out there, like the protocol, um, perhaps before we start working on another huge international um, initiative, maybe get some traction with, with that framework first. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I think those critical thresholds and defining them is, is extremely important. Can I just ask you, Martin, going back to your first answer <clears throat> there, where you were talking about uh, an intermediate body to help in this, who would that be provided by? Would that be by a ministry? Yeah. 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 They should be paid. It, it takes time for a, for a bridging organization to work with the, with the knowledge there is. They should be paid. And I don't know whether companies are willing to pay for that kind of, of people. Um, in Flanders, it works. There are, um, we call them net regional landscapes. They are paid by the government for working with nature. And um, they work with individual farmers, individual companies, to uh, increase biodiversity. Um, but they should also, they can also be used to to work with national capital, so biodiversity in a more usable way. But I think governments are best placed to. But it, it's difficult in times of cri financial crisis to to make. But it it, it works. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So There's one more question. I think we have time for. Maybe a couple of minutes still. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kira. And thank, thank you, panel. Uh, Andrew St. Ledger, uh, Centre for Environmental Living and Training. Um, to, just um, in terms of e address to e each of you, uh, g given that there's an acceptance that ecology and economy, like a healthy ecology is important to a healthy economy and a healthy society, and that bo both um, of those terms come from the Greek word oikos. One could be simply put as good housekeeping and the other is linked to the ecosystems, maintaining the ecosystem services to maintain the house. And that we have a convention on biological diversity that each of your member states, I assume, have signed up to, which addresses the critical situation that we're facing, like a mass extinction of species um, caused by man-made actions how much influence has the Convention on Biological Diversity on your natural capital accounting? And how, how much influence will it have on your actions? Because, you know, the, there is, um, the Convention is addressing the, the critical issues of biodiversity loss. It's attached to the Declaration on the Environment, 1992, Sustainable Development, which it, for the first time acknowledged the pressures or, or you know, for the first time articulated the fact that uh, we're facing serious ecological and societal breakdown if we don't address these issues. So in 1993, the Convention on Biological Diversity was also signed and attached to that declaration. So, thank you. Okay, we... So I think the question was coming... I couldn't actually see where the question was coming from as I was looking around the room. Um, Absolutely critically important. I mean, I think the IG targets, the sustainable development goals, all of those arguably become even more important in a post-Brexit um, world because we're already committed to other international um, efforts to, uh, to address these issues. So, yeah, very important. Yeah, I think, uh, as I tried to say uh, earlier, nature law and, nature and environmental laws uh, are very much needed. Uh, they won't be replaced, I hope. Um, maybe uh, we shall go on further, but uh, we, th we look at natural capital uh, approaches as uh, something to add uh, onto the t terrain that uh, natural law and, and uh, environmental laws don't, uh, uh, don't manage. And um, we, we look on natural capital as a way of mainstreaming uh, nature uh, conservation into all sectors of society. Um, I think it's uh, really uh, essential. You just need both sides of the coin. Um, that's also what the EU biodiversity uh, strategy says. Target one is protect um, yeah, nature 2000 areas, which are the, the most uh, critical nature things. That's one side of the coin, but the other side of the coin 
is the ecosystem services. They're just helping each other. Um, I don't say that if you protect the ecosystem services that you automatically um, protect biodiversity in its global uh, context, but they just help each other. And we should aim for both um, things, protect um, yeah, critical species and uh, protect uh, natural capital or ecosystem services. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much and thanks for all the questions. Um, okay, well that brings an end to that particular segment of this afternoon and you might just express your thanks to the speakers again. <laughs> <laughs>